So one of the things that structured analytic techniques are supposed to help us do is they're supposed to help us counter bias. And I want to talk a little bit about that um, and how some of the different structured analytic techniques that exist line up with some of the different biases um, that are out there that oftentimes affect the judgment of analysts. And for this discussion, I'll be pulling pretty heavily from um, a paper uh, by Mary Broadman and Randy Fearson. And Randy is sort of one of the, the gurus of structured analytic techniques. And I really love this paper. Uh, I've got the title and all the information in there. It was presented at the International Studies Association um, annual convention a couple years back. And one of the things that they do is they sort of go through and they um, interview a bunch of analysts and give them a survey and ask them sort of what are the biases uh, that affect you? And in the paper, they sort of lay out 31 um, different biases that might potentially impact an analyst's uh, ability to work with information. Um, and they sort of identified what were the, the 10 most frequently cited biases that analysts believe affect them. And so I'd like to run through those 10 and then talk about some of the structured analytic techniques and how they might help counter some of that. So the first of those is confirmation bias, right? And confirmation bias is the idea that you're seeking out information that tells you what you think you already know, that maybe you're pushing back against information that doesn't fit with your pre-existing worldview. Um, but this is something that human beings are, are really susceptible. And it's not surprising that that was the number one bias that analysts said they struggled with in their own work. Um, a second bias is the anchoring effect, uh, which is there's a lot of psychological research on this, that human beings have a hard time knowing how to navigate uncertainty uh, and to provide sort of a sense of what's normal or right or average. Um, and so we will latch on to the first piece of information that we get and we will use that piece of information as sort of the starting point for our reasoning process. And so there's a famous <laughs> study about this where um, people were given um, money to bid on different objects at an auction. And before this bidding started, people were asked to think about the last two digits of their social security number. And people whose social security number had a high you know, two digits, maybe like 98 or something, were more likely to, to bid higher than people who had lower two digit numbers for their social end of their social security number. And the suggestion of that is just having one piece of information, a number, it's more or less random, um, that's in your mind before you start the process is going to shape how you think about other numbers, right? And how much a, a large bid versus a small bid would be. Um, and this shows up in, in intelligence analysis as well, where you don't necessarily know um, what the likelihood of something is. So if you see another piece of information, suddenly that piece of information sort of anchors and you build off of that. And that initial piece of information may not have been accurate or even close to accurate. So uh, there's the desire for coherence and uncertainty reduction. This is something that human beings are really susceptible to. We are pattern recognizers. And when we navigate the world, we assume that there's order and structure and meaning and things work. And so it's really easy for us to map meaning onto randomness, to assume that there's intentionality where there's not. Um, and so we, we oftentimes will over analyze the world um, in a way that's maybe not always accurate. Uh, we engage in satisficing pretty frequently, uh, selecting the first answer that appears good enough rather than considering the full range of things. It's sort of a, a shortcut of working through the complexity of the world by simply ignoring it and going with something that seems to make sense. Uh, there's the mental shotgun approach, which is kind of like satisficing. Um, it's sort of grabbing sort of quick and easy answers to complex questions um, in the lead up to uh, after the U.S. invasion of Iraq, um, I was uh, working at the uh, Transparency International, an international non-governmental organization uh, based in Berlin, and people kept saying, oh, the United States simply, you know, invaded Iraq for oil. And I kept trying to be like, no, there was so much more than just oil going on. Oil is part of the story, but what you're engaging is mental shotgunning. You're taking that complexity and you're ignoring it because you've got a, a very simple, straightforward answer that you can input into that, that problem very quickly. Um, vividness bias, uh, 
is another thing that, that really affects people, um, that we tend to lock on to the piece of information that is sensational, the piece of information that, that stands out. Um, we're much more likely to remember um, going to the gas pump and seeing sort of you know $5 a gallon and thinking, oh my gosh, that's so high, rather than all the times where the price of gas sort of ticks down or is in sort of the, the middle range. Um, because our brains lock on to information that seems unusual. And that can, again, combining with the anchoring effect, really drive our interpretation of what's happening in a situation um, because of how we um, focus on that information that seems sensational, even if it's not representative. Um, there's the availability heuristic, um, favoring information and interpretations that come more easily to mind. Again, I think this is similar to the vividness bias, that if there's an experience that you've had or something that you've you've been thinking about a lot, if you can recall it quickly, you're going to anchor on that, um, whether or not it's an appropriate comparison or an appropriate analogy or an appropriate piece of information to work with. Uh, just a couple more of these. We've got mirror image thinking. Uh, this is, again, something human beings are, are really prone to. We assume that other people will behave and think about and analyze problems the way that we behave and think about and analyze problems. During the Cold War, this was a factor for analysts when they were thinking about sort of nuclear weapons and, and how nuclear weapons would be deployed and the value and utility of intercontinental ballistic missiles, which are based out where I am in North Dakota. Uh, and the, the calculation was that it would take probably three warheads to destroy a missile silo that sort of cemented into the ground. And therefore these missile silos functioned as uh, warhead sinks that the Soviet Union would have to divert lots of warheads to destroy them. And that would mean that the Soviet arsenal would not be able to, you know, strike at targets of actual value, like cities. Except the Soviet Union wasn't working with that calculation. They sort of shrugged and said, eh, one warhead's probably good enough. Even if we don't get it, we'll get most of them. And they weren't working the same assumption that the U.S. was working with, which is three is the minimum that you're going to want to uh, throw at those, at those silos. But again, that's pretty common that human beings have a reasoning process and they just assume that other people are using a similar kind of process in navigating the world. Uh, groupthink isn't really a individual cognitive bias, but it is something that I think is worth being aware of. It's sort of how the pressure for conformity within groups can result in uh, a number of really bad and dangerous um, ways of working with information. Irving Janis, the sort of guru who, who defined groupthink, would, would say that there's a couple different forms and that it ends up resulting in a failure of groups to uh, evaluate information, to test their assumptions, to lose track of reality. Um, they, they become increasingly risk acceptant. Uh, they don't consider risk uh, the way that people would as individuals, and they fail to use uh, moral reasoning um, because of the nature of those group dynamics. So we become sort of evil, dangerous, and delusional as a result of interacting through groups. Uh, not a guarantee, but it is a dynamic that can emerge within groups. Um, overconfidence bias. Uh, this is something that certainly affects me, <laughs> believing that I have a pretty good handle on complex events, that I'm in a situation to direct and control and navigate. Um, human beings tend to do this. We tend to, to map ourselves into situations and um, create that false sense of I'm in control and I have understanding of when we as human beings rarely have full understanding or are in full control of the events that are happening around us. Uh, and then lastly, premature closure. I think this one is sort of similar to satisficing where you stop seeking out new information um, that, or you, you stop sort of building that information into your analysis because you think you, you've got an answer. Um, and so you, you stop your process. So these are the, the 10 biases that analysts have sort of said are most likely to affect their work. And the question is then, so how do we counter this? Is simply knowing them and simply naming them enough, or do we need to use a method to try to counter these? And one of the things that um, this paper does is it tries to sort of match up these various different biases as along with, you know, another 20 or so um, with different structured analytic techniques to sort of see how that they, how those techniques can maybe mitigate those bias. And so I'll just quickly run through um, a couple of these, these techniques. So we have the key assumption check where you sort of write down on paper, like these are the things that I believe. These are things that are not coming from the data that I have. These are assumptions that I'm bringing to the table with me. 
And I want to be aware of those. I want to make those public so other people can scrutinize those. I want to state them and realize that I'm putting information together because of those assumptions, not because of, of what that information says. And again, that can help with a variety of these things, right? The, the mirror imaging or the mental shotgun um, approach, the vividness bias, like a lot of those things can be potentially mitigated by simply writing out our assumptions that we're bringing to the table. We could use starbursting, which is structured brainstorming, but brainstorming not around answers, it's brainstorming around questions. So who, what, why, when, where, and how. And we're just trying to sort of raise questions like, what do I know? Why is this happening? <laughs> how did this occur? Where did this piece of information come from? When did this piece of information um, get generated? And as I'm building these questions, um, it forces me to kind of work through the information that I have, to consider it from different perspectives, to recognize what are the gaps and what I, I don't necessarily know. And that can help us sort of work with that information more efficiently, we think. And so, uh, Randy and Mary have identified a, a range of, of um, techniques that they think, or uh, biases that they think this helps to mitigate. Uh, a third method, um, argument mapping, uh, where you simply try to diagram out um, the evidence and how it supports or doesn't support uh, your conclusion. Uh, there's a variety of techniques for doing this. Uh, I've been working on a video on Wigmore diagrams and sort of introducing them and sort of providing my way of kind of aggregating information together that I think is doing a similar kind of thing, but maybe is doing it a little bit more intuitively. Um, but that can again be helpful in terms of forcing you to work through the complexity of an argument, right? You're less likely to do mental shotgunning if you're forced to sort of write down all the pros and cons for an argument and sort of assess how they fit together and how they tell that story. We have analysis of competing hypotheses. This is something that I've done a couple videos on. This is where you identify a set of possible explanations for a situation that are ideally mutually exclusive um, and comprehensive and exhaustive of all the possibilities. And then you consider all the information and how it lines up and is consistent with or inconsistent with these different hypotheses. And so that forces you to consider multiple perspectives. It forces you to work with all the evidence. It forces you to sort of have the conversation about each piece of evidence and whether or not it supports or doesn't support. Um, actually, that's not the right word. It's consistent with or isn't consistent with. That's, that's a better terminology. Um, your different hypotheses. And again, hopefully this will force us away from some of those common biases that affect people. Um, there's this classic quadrant crunching technique, which I have not um, ever worked with or have never, not really studied in great detail, but the, the sort of introduction I was able to sort of scrape together seems really promising. It, it essentially takes some of those assumptions that we start with um, that we may have identified in that earlier sort of um, technique of um, laying out your key assumptions. And it says, okay, let's make some, some assumptions about those assumptions and let's make them false. Right? I think the world works this way. What if it doesn't work that way? And then we work our anal analysis out through those alternate assumptions and we find out, wow, that, that assumption is really critical. Like if that's wrong, <laughs> this whole thing falls apart. Or my analysis actually doesn't hinge on that assumption because I can make that the exact opposite of what I believe and the story still holds together. And, and it's, it's essentially the same thing as I, I thought. Um, and that can be really helpful to identify those linchpin assumptions um, upon which the entire thing sets. And once you've identified those linchpin assumptions, you can go back and scrutinize them you know, doubly and triply. You can look for information that you would be able to point to to say, I think this is correct, or this is how I think that maybe I'm on the wrong path. Um, so identifying indicators that you can monitor uh, for the future. Uh, we have um, indicator generation and validation. Again, that's sort of what you would be doing after you've identified those key assumptions that you really need to make sure are right. right? What are the things that you can track and observe? Um, indicators that might change over time that would tell you, yes, I continue to be right, or things are shifting. Just simply identifying and thinking about what are those indicators that you'd want to be tracking can force us to really build a, mental, a complete mental model about how everything works together. Um, it can force us to recognize when our assumptions are not right, when things are veering in a direction that we didn't anticipate. And so that's a, you know, a fifth or sixth method. Uh, and then a final method I'd like to briefly introduce is the pre-mortem. And I've done a video on this as well. Um, it's where you assume the counter factual. Um, so I think my analysis is right, but I'm going to momentarily assume that I got it 
cataclysmically wrong, like just massively wrong. And so now I have to figure out why that happened. Um, and so I'm going to brainstorm, like what were the weak points? What were the questions I didn't ask? What were the, the information I didn't have that I could have had or I should have had that I glossed over? And ideally, as you're brainstorming, you're going to find the weak points in your argument. And that finding those weak points in your argument will allow you to then go back and say, all right, so this was a really critical assumption. And, it, you know, did I have the data to, to actually make that that assumption, that inference, can I support this? And if the answer is no, maybe that needs to be built into your analysis, that this is a, a critical assumption and you can't really know for sure. And if you don't have it, the whole thing collapses because you've sort of done that process of how would my analysis have failed so wrongly? What would that path look like? Um, and having sketched that out can then help you find indicators and do other things that can help you sort of longer term um, improve your analysis. So there's a lot going on here. Um, and I want to just kind of take a second to, to recognize um, that there's a lot going on with structured analytic techniques, and we're going to introduce a lot of them over the next, you know, couple of weeks in, in different videos. Um, but the goal of these techniques is to help us to mitigate bias, that we as human beings oftentimes bring to the table ways of thinking about the information and ways of thinking about the world that can lead us astray. And we can try to be cognizant of those biases and of those those errors, um, but human beings are just really bad at doing that on their own. And structured analytic techniques are a process to force us to be more reflective, to be more aware of our own thinking, to do critical thinking in sort of a, a positive sense of how to put things together in a way that it is defensible and, and rigorous uh, and will hopefully be compelling and convincing to folks, and ideally is less likely to make cataclysmically bad um, judgments and uh, conclusions. And so that's the goal of what we're trying to do with all of this.